Good day, everyone, and welcome to Hudson's first quarter 2020 earnings call. All participants will be in late listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please also note that today's event is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Cindy Buckwalter, Vice President of Investor Relations and Corporate Communications for Hudson. Ms. Buckwalter, you may begin. Thank you, Operator, and good day, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. This afternoon, we released our first quarter results. You can find a copy of our press release and the presentation on our website at investors.hudsongroup.com, along with our Q1 financial statements. On today's call, we have Roger Fordyce, our CEO, and Adrian Bartella, our CFO. Please note that management may make forward-looking statements regarding their beliefs and expectations as to the company's future business prospects and results. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from these statements. Although we believe the expectations reflected in our forward-looking statements are reasonable, we can give no assurance that such expectations will be realized. We urge everyone to review the safe harbor statements provided in our earnings release and financial statements today, as well as the risk factors contained in our 2019 annual report on Form 20F, which is available on our website. During today's call, we'll refer to both IFRS and non-IFRS financial measures of the company's operating and financial results. For information regarding our non-IFRS financial measures and reconciliation to the most directly comparable IFRS measures, please refer to our earnings release. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Roger. Thank you, Cindy, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us to review our first quarter 2020 results. I want to begin my remarks today by acknowledging how much has changed in the world since we last spoke back in March. When the COVID-19 pandemic first began, we could never have imagined the unprecedented impact that it would have on the global economy, world travel, and on so many businesses, including ours. Our thoughts go out to everyone who has been impacted as a result of this virus, including our team members, customers, partners, vendors, and landlords, all who have endured significant hardship but have remained strong in the face of adversity. Looking back at the first quarter, we started off on a positive growth trend in the first few weeks of January, despite the closure of our New Orleans operation in November of last year. However, passenger traffic and sales started to decrease later in the month as COVID-19 began to impact inbound passenger traffic from Asia and continued to decline further as the virus spread globally in March. Following the World Health Organization's declaration of a global pandemic, the TSA passenger throughput soon reflected a volume reduction of about 90% by late March. Air travel continued to decrease even more sharply in April, with the TSA passenger volumes down 95% year over year, leading to our decision to close more than 700 of our stores temporarily furlough and temporarily furlough a majority of our team members. As outlined in our press release today, we also took a number of significant actions to reduce expenses and preserve liquidity to ensure the fiscal health of our business, including instituting salary reductions for corporate team members and our field leadership, reducing operating expenses and capital spend to minimal levels, and very tightly managing inventory. Additionally, we began working with our landlords to secure rent waivers and deferrals in order to better align our cash outflow with our significantly reduced sales levels. To date, we've been relatively pleased with the response from our landlords. However, we are closely monitoring passenger and sales level rebounds market by market, and we will continue to work with our landlords on additional requests in the markets where travel remains at low levels. Adrian will be, pro will be providing further details on the rent waivers later on in the call. As we work to ensure our financial stability, we were also rapidly instituting in-store measures to ensure the health and safety of our team members, customers, and the essential workers still traveling. 
Through the efforts of our internal emergency response team, we were able to secure an extensive supply of personal protection equipment, develop enhanced store cleaning protocol, implement in-store social distancing measures, and expand our contactless payment capabilities, among other initiatives. I'm incredibly proud and grateful for how both our field and corporate team members stepped up to address this unprecedented challenge, and for our business partners who have continued to work jointly with us to seek rent relief in our local communities. Above all, we greatly appreciate the efforts of our frontline team members who continue to work in our open stores during the pandemic to serve those still traveling, including essential workers such as healthcare professionals and airport and commuter hub personnel. Looking ahead to where we stand today, we have slowly begun to reopen stores as passenger volumes have gradually been increasing. The decision to reopen our stores and bring back a number of our furloughed team members has been in close alignment with our landlord partners and the lifting of stay-at-home measures. In doing so, we have taken extraordinary steps to ensure our stores are supplied with ample personal protection equipment and that enhanced health and safety measures are in place as we begin to welcome back our team members and customers. As of this past Monday, we have reopened over 100 stores with plans for additional reopenings each week at an accelerated pace. While this is a difficult process, our rebuilding efforts have benefited from our, our ability to keep our operations open during the pandemic, although at a reduced capacity. Due in part to the effort of our team members still working, we are able to reopen locations more quickly in comparison to our competitors. We expect that traveling trends will be different at every location, and so we will continue to do pilot tests of store openings before resuming full operations in a location. Our travel convenience stores have been the first to reopen. However, even now we're starting to open specialty retail stores as well. We are also beginning to slowly reopen our duty-free stores in alignment with the gradual but steady increase in international flights, although we do expect this to be the last part of our business to return, given the ongoing restrictions in international travel. And our expectation is that leisure travel will pick up much more quickly than business travel. While we are pleased to see that passenger volume levels are gradually increasing from the record low numbers experienced in April, we are still witnessing passenger volumes through the second week of June that are approximately 85% below last year, making business conditions extremely challenging. Our ongoing actions to reduce expenses and manage cash flow are critical in navigating this crisis and positioning Hudson for a full recovery and successful long-term growth. Despite these headwinds, we are confident in the resiliency of the travel re retail business as we've seen in the past, and we remain focused on our strategic imperative to become the all-encompassing travel partner and grow our four key pillars, travel convenience, specialty, duty-free, and food and beverage. And while some of our initiatives have been temporarily slow due to the current conditions, We've continued to drive our business forward in a number of important growth areas. On the retail side of our business, we're pleased to have recently secured several contract extensions. In Des Moines, we signed a four-year extension, and in both Charleston and Myrtle Beach, we secured a five-year extension. Lastly, we strengthened our partnership with Atlantic City International Airport with a 10-year contract extension. During the course of working with our landlords on rent relief, we have also begun discussions with multiple airports about potential lease extensions to offset lost business opportunity. On the food and beverage side, we're also seeing some new opportunities to provide grab-and-go products in airports where food and beverage companies have not yet opened. We've also had two recent notable store openings that demonstrate our ability to stay on course and continue to operate at a very high level even in the midst of a global pandemic with New York at the epicenter. We successfully opened two stores this past Saturday, the date of the grand opening of the LaGuardia Terminal B, which unveiled two new localized travel convenience stores, New York City Aglow and Mad Avenue Market. Both stores are inspired by the history and culture of New York City and feature a locally sourced selection of gifts and snacks. Mad Avenue Market also features self-checkout capabilities. We're very proud of our teams who worked under extreme conditions 
to meet the opening deadline. Moving to digital initiatives, we've continued to adapt our business model to adjust to the behavioral change in travelers as the result of COVID-19. Last week, we announced our first venture into automated retailing with the introduction of our personal protection equipment vending machines to 27 airports across North America starting at the end of June. The vending machines will be located in pre-security locations and will be stocked with a proprietary line of essential PPE products, thermometers, ultraviolet light sanitizing products, providing an opportunity to create a 24-7 retailing experience. The same product line, which will be marketed under Hudson's Traveler's Best brand, will also be offered in all of our travel convenience stores within our Travel Safe, Travel Well displays. Additionally, to continue to adapt to the heightened expectations for contactless shopping environments, we've enhanced tap to bay capabilities in all of our stores, we've added self-scanning capabilities, and are continuing to actively pursue a greater digital presence in our stores, including expanding our self-checkout capabilities and exploring alternatives to the traditional shopping environment. Our Hudson Booksellers has also enhanced its e-commerce presence through our HudsonBooksellers.com platform. Lastly, this morning, or just this morning, we are pleased to announce a strategic partnership with Luxottica, a leader in premier eyewear. Over the next few years, we will be introducing 250 Sunglass Hut shop and shops to our travel convenience concepts across North America. The addition of Sunglass Hut to our portfolio will make it more convenient than ever for travelers to shop for sunglasses, and this complements our current offering of Fifth and Sunset stores. While COVID-19 has challenged the travel industry like never before, it has shown us how adaptive our business model can be. We are continuing to make decisions that are in alignment with the evolving passenger trends and will position us for long-term success. Thanks, one again, thanks once again to our incredible support support of our team members, our business partners, and our landlords. We're in the early stages of our road to recovery. We look forward to rebounding from this crisis stronger than ever, with an enhanced focus on expanding our footprint to new retailing opportunities and overall continued emphasis on adapting digital innovation into our operating model. I'll now turn it over to Adrian to review our first quarter results in more detail. Thank you, Roger. Now turning to the results of, for the quarter. As Roger noted, our first quarter results were significantly impacted by COVID-19 and the reduction in travel most significant in the last two weeks of the quarter. Turnover in the first quarter decreased by 23.3% to 341.5 million compared to the first quarter of 2019. Organic net sales, which is a combination of like-for-like -like sales and net new business, declined 24.2%. Like for like sales decreased 22.4% on a constant currency basis. The like for like sales in our duty paid business decreased by 19.4%, while our duty free business declined by 31.1%. Regarding the second component of organic growth, net new business, total contribution of net new business was down 1.7% in Q1. Gross margin was 62.5% compared to 63.8% in the prior year first quarter. As noted in the earnings release, 140 basis points of the decrease was due to an additional inventory allowance of 4.7 million for slow moving and obsolete items resulting from the extended store closures. This expense decreased by 51.3% to 13.5 million reflecting lower variable rent based on decline in sales, and rent waivers of 3.3 million received from numerous airports and commuter terminals associated with waived rent payments that were primarily due for March 2020. As Roger noted, we continue to have ongoing discussions with landlords, and the rent waivers are expected to increase significantly in the second quarter due to the timing of waivers that have been granted. Personal expenses decreased by 15.9% to 96.7 million. The decrease was primarily due to a 
7.6 million of executive separation expense recorded in the last year's first quarter, as well as the expense management actions we took towards the end of the first quarter this year in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As a percentage of turnover, personal expenses increased to 28.3% from 25.8% due to the lower sales levels that quickly materialized late in the first quarter. Other expenses decreased by 7% to 37.3 million, primarily driven by a reduction in variable selling expenses due to the sales decline. As a percentage of turnover, other expenses were 10.9%, compared to 9% in Q1 2019. Other income, which was previously reported in other expense line, is now a separate line item. This consists of sales-related income, franchise and management fee income, and other operational income. Other income decreased by 7.4% from the first quarter of 2019. Depreciation, amortization, and impairment increased by 56 million to 144.6 million. This was primarily due to a non-cash goodwill impairment charge of 52 million reflecting a reduction in forecasted cash flow due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Adjusted EBITDA decreased by 43.1 million year over year to a negative 5.4 million. Adjusted EPS attributable to equity holders of the parent was a loss of 28 cents for the first quarter. Turning to our balance sheet and uh, cash flow. The cash flow from operating activities for the quarter was 24.9 million, compared to 111.2 million in the prior year period. The decrease in the cash flow line was driven by decline in operating performance due to COVID-19 and the timing of increased cash payments for accounts payables. The cash flow used in investing activities increased slightly to 19.4 million in the first quarter from 18.8 million in 2019. Primary due to higher capital expenditures in information technology. Our adjusted net debt, which represents total borrowings, excluding lease obligations minus cash, was 315.4 million, including a 225.6 million available cash balance, and resulting in a net debt to adjusted EBITDA leverage of 1.7 times. While the net debt was higher and available cash balance lower than at year end, we feel comfortable with the current debt and liquidity position, given our ongoing personal and other operating expense reductions, combined with the rent waivers and abatements we have received from many landlords. Additionally, as Roger noted, while still at very low levels, we are seeing travel volume gradually increase from the record lows we experienced in April. Looking ahead, given the current low level of travel, both business and leisure, we expect continued pressure from tra on traffic and sales in near term. As we can't currently estimate the duration and future trajectory of travel disruption, we don't believe it's prudent to provide guidance at this time. However, we feel very good about our ability to execute against the things that are in our control, including continued highly disciplined cost management in response to sales trends. Fortunately, we enter this crisis in a strong financial position. With our existing cash balances as of end of May of 204 million, expected operating cash flows and long-term financing arrangements with our controlling shareholder Dufri, we believe we have adequate funds to support our revised operating plan, make necessary capital expenditures and fulfill debt service requirements for the foreseeable future. In summary, while we currently have safe pressures related to the coronavirus, the travel retail industry is a resilient one, and we are confident in the long-term potential of our model. We will continue to advance our digital initiatives in line with consumer behavior trends, expand our brand partnerships, and drive the growth of our food and beverage business, all against the backdrop of strict financial discipline. I will now turn it back over to the operator and to open it up to the Q&A. 
we will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Michael Lasser with UBS. Please go ahead. Good evening. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Roger, what level of passenger traffic in the U.S. does Hudson need to experience in order to break even? You know, I think that's a real tough question to, to benchmark, primarily because you know, the passenger flows in every airport are a little bit different, and as you know, the structures across many of our contracts are very, very different. So it, it's difficult to kind of put a broad brush stroke across, um, you know, a, a universal uh, snapshot of that. Uh, I would tend to think that, you know, as we near closer to 50% return, we probably near that as an average overall. So that 50% return, you know, has to be, you know, favorable, uh, you know, across the spectrum of all of our contracts in order for that to be a fair statement. So a, a, mil a million in, in, and uh, are you expecting that it will gradually build over the course of this year to that level? I think there was 500,000 people who recently passed through the TFA line so versus uh, two million a year ago so is it, is it reasonable to expect we'll get to a million by the end of this year again i don't have a crystal ball and i would be remiss in trying to, to forecast where i think things could end up we are um, optimistic that you know the return you know continues to remain steady if you look at the passenger flows those tsa numbers you just mentioned and, and take a look at the trends of how they have evolved uh, since the end of March through just recently. Okay. Um, my follow-up question is on the nature of the, the traffic. If more of the traffic is dominated by uh, leisure travel uh, versus business travel or one of the other Florida to come back, how does your spend per passenger compare um, in, in, you know, leisure travel versus business travel? And if, if airlines are going to be reducing the amount of food and beverage that they offer to passengers while in flight, what is the opportunity to boost spend per traveler uh, because of that? So uh, typically our analysis has shown that the, the spend between business and leisure has pretty historically on the convenience side of the business been about the same. Uh, and, and, yes, a uh, reduction of any food and beverage served on the planes, served in the airports, uh, will enhance uh, our overall spend, as is the, the new opportunity of the personal protection equipment we've added as well, too, which is kind of a new ancillary spend, you know, should continue to help uh, improve our overall spend. On the convenience side. And my last question is, Roger, recognizing that it's only been a, a, you know, a few weeks, in some of these, the heart of these, some of these changes have been made. Have you noticed a rise in, in spend per tra uh, spend per passenger as a result of some of this? So once again, overall, remember a, a good part of the stores that were closed were a lot of our specialty stores. That when we look and the duty free stores, that when we look at a blend overall as an organization, um, because right now convenience stores are a big part of what's driving our business. That is, that is not true overall. What we are seeing, though, is on the convenience side of our business, where that is driving the business right now, we are seeing an average increase in that convenience spend. Can you quantify that, Roger, just in the convenience piece? Uh, I, I don't have those numbers right now to, to know what the latest spend on that convenience side is right now. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. The next question is from Seth Sigmund with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I wanted to start a little bit with the cost structure and thinking about the decremental margins. Uh, I think we talked about 30 to 50% decremental margins for the full year previously. How should we be thinking about that for the second quarter? And, and just given the rent waivers, and obviously stores were closed for a lot of the quarter, 
which I think was different than when you gave that number initially, should we expect it to be better than we talked about previously? Uh, hi, Seth. Uh, here's Adrian. Uh, I think the 30 to 50 percent is still valid. Um, um, I would expect uh, um, it to be a bit better than in the first quarter, uh, taking into account the rent waivers we have received. Uh, we expect around 30 to 50 million in rent waivers to, uh, to to receive around 30 to 50 million rent waivers in the second quarter uh, compared to the 3.3 in the first quarter. So uh, obviously the sales uh, will be a bit softer than in the first quarter, so this will offset a bit uh, the waivers. But uh, in general terms, the 30 to 50 percent uh, uh, range is still valid. Okay, got it. And then maybe just an update on the food and beverage strategy, you know, specifically the OHM deal not going through. Can you just remind us how you're thinking about that, what some of the options are? I think uh, the release had talked about maybe exploring some alternative options with them. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about that. And then related, you know, do you think uh, on the back of COVID there will be structural changes in how consumers, you know, uh, shop food and beverage or interact with restaurants in the terminals? Uh, are you rethinking at all the types of model in food and beverage that can work and maybe play to your strength? Thanks. Hey, Seth, it's Roger. I, I think, you know, from our perspective, food and beverage is still something that, you know, we're, we're still very, very excited and are, are aggressively looking at as part of our long-term growth. I think you, you hit probably one of the greatest challenges that we're looking at is, is what – does COVID-19 mean to the overall food and beverage portfolio in an airport, particularly as it relates to sit-down uh, sit down restaurants, uh, queuing, and, and other aspects. So, you know, and we've been having conversations with many airport and landlords as well, too, in that regard to understand what their thoughts are as airports long-term start to look at the evolution of what COVID-19 means to their overall programs. Um, we continue to look at grab and go as, as unique opportunities. We are continuing to look at cafes and quick serve as things that we could add and tap on to our retail contracts very, very quickly. Um, and at some point in time, as, as things evolve a little bit more, we will continue to look at M&A as, as part of our long-term strategy. Thank you for that. Could you just update us on OHM? Is that something that is still being explored or is that dead at this point? And then, you know, anything else on the pipeline? That would be helpful. I, I would uh, basically just just comment that you know the the deal that we had structured was was turned back on April one. Uh, we are keeping you know all any and all options open as it relates to M and A, but clearly want to have a, you know better uh, insight into how food and beverage is going to develop in the future to ensure that we're targeting the the correct targets. Makes sense. All right. Thanks a lot. The next question is from Kimberly Greenberger with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you so much, um, and thanks for all the commentary today. Um, I wanted to ask, um, the 85% uh, you indicated in your press release that in uh, through the second week of June, you're seeing uh, approximately 85% below last year levels, and I wanted to know, is that – a quarter-to-date revenue number, um, and if not, if you could just help us understand what the quarter-to-date number is, that would be really helpful. And I think it's a little premature to, hi, Kimberly, it's Roger, a little premature to start talking about, you know, quarter-to-date. What that uh, number reflected was where the current um, TSA passenger trends were running, 85% below last year. Uh, and as Michael Lasseter had commented earlier on, obviously, if you take a look back to um, to early April, the, the passenger trends, the TSA passenger trends, uh, I would I would have to say, and I, I will caveat this by indicating that TSA represents only U.S. passenger counts um, and is all passengers across the USA. And of course, we don't we were not exposed to all passenger counts, um, but our, our sales have been. Uh, pretty much trending where the TSA passenger counts have been uh, for for the second quarter so far. And then once again, I want to caution that that is no way, you know, should be indicative of, of future trends. And only to date, uh, we have been trending along the lines of how the TSA passenger numbers have been reported. Great. That's really helpful, Roger. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then I'm, I'm wondering if you can just help us think about your business 
in terms of, and I think there are three primary categories, but please do correct me if I'm wrong. We've got the duty-free business, and then within duty paid, you have specialty stores versus convenience. Um, with the changed travel behavior and changed trends, um, can you just talk about the relative impact to each of those pieces of, of revenue? And if you have a, a rough proportion of sales, I know we've got the duty-free numbers, but if you could help us understand the proportion of sales for specialty stores, as an example, as well, just so that we can try to think about um, how revenue, you know, we can do a better job estimating how revenue might look for the rest of the year if we just understand a little bit more about the composition of your revenue and which pieces you think are going to be much slower to come back as opposed to faster to recover. So on, on the duty paid side of the business, uh, I, we have never really broken that out from the point of view of, of separating what, what portion is in specialty and convenience. Um, clearly, the duty free we have over the, over the past um, you know year or two, particularly because of the Asian impact to that particular part of the or component of the business. Um, in, in regards to the second part of your question, you know, convenience has been the area that we're focusing on. Uh, but as we've mentioned, you know, both in the press release as well as in our report today, we are starting to actually open up specialty stores as well, too. We are finding a demand for shopping. You saw some of the reports today about resales significantly rebounding from, from street. Uh, we're seeing some of the same things. There is some pent-up demand, so uh, we are starting to open up our specialty shops uh, in addition to convenience. But convenience has really been our focus um, throughout April, May, and even into early June, but are now focusing on balancing that out with the specialty to ensure that we're maximizing the, the revenues in each individual airport. Great. Thank you so much. This concludes our question and answer session. I'll now, now turn the call back over to Ms. Buckwalter. Please go ahead. Thanks, Gary. Uh, that does conclude our call today. Just a reminder, you can find the replay of today's call on the Investor Relations section of our website. So thank you all for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.